Okay, well, we're really excited today because are recently a report, a monumental report entitled Recruit Soil to Tackle Climate Change, a Roadmap for Canada, has been released by two long-standing powerful organizations, the Soil Conservation Council of Canada and the Compost Council of Canada, both of whom are intricately linked to the soil. And we have Jim Tokarczuk, the Executive Director of the Soil Conservation Council of Canada, and Glenn Monroe, our Soil Health Champion for the Compost Council, here today to talk us a little bit about the report. Jim and Glenn, welcome to our, our chat. Can you Talk to us a little bit about uh, how this report came about and, and what, what you have to say to Canada. Yes, thanks, Susan. It's, uh, it's great to be here and uh, it's great to be in, in this wonderful partnership with the Con uh, Compost Council of Canada. Um, first of all, I'll mention that uh, this, this recording is going to be released during National Soil Conservation Week, which is really good timing for this. National Soil Conservation Week is one of the, the events in, in, in the year the third week of April every year, where we can really speak to the public about the value that soil brings to them and the importance of, of the ongoing maintenance and care of our soil resource. Our organization is a soil health advocate and uh, uh, this project, which was really about enhancing soil carbon, um, is important to us because soil health, our main, our main business, and soil carbon are so linked you can't separate them. So any project that helps us to increase carbon, carbon levels in, in Canadian soils is of interest to us. And so that's what brought us to the table at this project with you as our partner. Super. It's a pretty awesome call to action to recruit soil, uh, to tackle the most pressing issue that we not only in Canada but worldwide have. What 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 does the report tell us? Well I, I think I think the most uh, the most important outcomes from the report uh, are that number one we have a good level of knowledge in science that tells us about carbon and soil how it how it flows in and out. Um, from that, we have uh, very good experience with soil health uh, and conservation practices on the farm and, and uh, other areas of managed soils. Um, and from that, we're seeing that soil is a very powerful tool in dealing with all kinds of benefits, but most importantly, in the case of this report, uh, the role that agriculture can play in mitigating and, and, and tackling uh, climate change in Canada. And I understand that both you, Jim and Glenn, uh, have uh, basically built a team from across the country to, to pull this report together. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about what the work was involved to get the report done? Yeah, I can I can speak to that one. Um, we uh, we started by by bringing together a, a group of and I, I won't name names because we'll forget. <laughs> somebody, but we started with a very a very very tight high level advisory committee of scientists, farmers, and and uh, people in in public life, and used used that to sort of flesh out the approach we were taking. We started this before COVID nineteen, and. Um, the idea was was that uh, Glenn uh, mostly was going to do a lot of face to face work at conferences and meetings and just sitting down with people across the country and uh, gathering their knowledge and experience in uh, in managing soils. Well, COVID nineteen happened. Not much you could do about that, so um, we had to shift and we used a, a series of of uh, Zoom meetings with individuals across the country. We did a survey uh, in advance and used those events to build that team of, of, of advocates for soil carbon and to use their knowledge in the creation of the report. And the report that we've just released uh, is the result of that. It's very powerful to, to realize that this uh, report that both organizations have put together 
uh, are um, basically a voice from all of Canada, that um, there's, a, um, there's a very powerful perspective that soil should be a natural ally for our, for our work to tackle climate change. What, are the what did you find in terms of the challenges? You, basically, the report is saying that uh, we can totally um, overcome any of the emissions that agriculture is contributing to climate change. What, what are the challenges to making that happen? Well, I can, uh, I can address that. Uh, first of all, I should say that I'm going to talk about things that make it hard to do, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's uh, not possible to do. As a matter of fact, exactly the opposite of that. But, but uh, moving forward, there are challenges for our soil managers in trying to uh, adopt the kinds of approaches and, and practices that we talked about. And these come from a variety of sort of categories, if you want. And one of the main ones is economic, because if you manage soil for a living, whether you're a golf course uh, superintendent or a farmer, or even just uh, somebody with a small uh, vegetable growing operation, it, you're, it's your livelihood. So you don't want to make changes unless you're pretty sure that those changes are not going to uh, put you out of business or put you at a disadvantage, a competitive disadvantage. So understanding that building carbon in soils uh, is uh, actually a financial benefit over time and that uh, the costs, are, if, if, if done properly, are, are quite manageable at the beginning and, and end up being uh, a benefit that's one of the big challenges is having is, is for people to understand soil managers to understand that and of course there's also some technical challenges because it involves maybe modifying your equipment or using different equipment uh, and there's uh, you know uh, understanding what's happening in the soil so there's there's a need for a lot more information to get out there to help growers to understand when they do something when they adopt a practice why is that helping them what's what's going on in the soil that makes that practice so beneficial and then of course uh there's also always cultural stuff that's happening because uh you know change is difficult and some people time some people have a hard time accepting change and when uh we I, i've spoken to farmers who are on the leading edge of this kind of thing and they find that uh they sometimes get a little bit of a rough ride from their neighbors and even from their families because of the way they're doing things, because it's different, right? It's a little bit different. So it, it looks different. And uh, th so they uh, they have to overcome that. So I, it is actually one group in Ontario is a support group that uh, that helps farmers who are who are uh, trying to advance their, their practices in this direction, helps where they can meet with each other and support each other because they don't always have the support of their of their communities. Right. So, Susan, one one point one point that's worth amplifying is that the findings of our of our study tell us that uh, with with moderate success in in getting more soil health practices on the landscape, we can we can eliminate the, the greenhouse gas footprint of agriculture in Canada, and that's. I think that's really achievable. And, but the really interesting part is if we go beyond that and we get uh, very high levels of adoption of, of soil conservation and health practices, we can do more for Canada. We can go beyond our footprint. And that's, that's the really exciting part, I think, of, of this. Um, and it's behind, behind your heads and in your, in, your, in your screen, there's a, a graph that shows that, that we can go further than, than just cleaning up a, our footprint, we can go beyond that for Canada. You know, maybe you could tell me a little bit more about um, healthy carbon rich soils, why they are so important. Just, just to, to, to go ahead and um, I'm sure that, you know, all these challenges that, you, that we've recognized through the report, they, they, what's the, the, the compelling argument in terms of, you know, moving it forward, but just tell me a little bit about just what about the whole issue of healthy carbon rich soils, their importance. So the case for high, uh, healthy, high, rich carbon rich soils really stands on its own. Um, those kinds of soils, healthy soils with lots of organic matter and carbon in them, do all kinds of things for us already. 
they they help to make the industry profitable and productive. In, in other words, it helps farmers to make a living. It grows the food we need, and we all need that. It helps to maintain biodiversity on the agricultural landscape, both above and below ground. Uh, it helps us to clean water. Um, and then on top of that, with what this report shows us is that it, it, it takes a big whack at climate change, um, makes, it, uh, makes it a pretty important uh, thing for, for us to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a huge benefit to Canadians. And the, 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 in your report, you spend a lot of time on the five principles for building healthy carbon rich soils. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I'll launch into that one. <clears throat> there, these, these five principles are, if you, if you look around on the internet, you'll find that, that we didn't make these up. These are principles that have been developed over the last decade or two by some of the leading experts in the field. Uh, we have our own uh, version of it, which is maybe a little different from some others, but it, they're all the same idea. The idea is that you need to protect the soil organisms. This is underlying a lot of this because in the, in the past it was thought, as long as we add carbon to the soil, as long as we you know put residue on and we add compost or things like that, we're going to build carbon. Well, that's true, but you might not build it as fast as you would like, because if the carbon is being lost from the soil, it's not being retained, then you know you're, you're in a, your, your flow is not going to be necessarily positive. What makes the flow positive is having a good, diverse, large set of soil organisms doing the work that they do, because they convert the, these organic materials into substances that can then be retained in the soil. So the principles are, in order to protect them. The first one is disturb the soil as little as possible because when you run plows through or if you're a gardener, you run your rototiller through, you're breaking their home up. You're, you're a home breaker, right? You're, a, you're taking all the work that they've done to build this nice structure where they can live and they know where they're going and they have their, the fungi have their strands running through it and it's a living ecosystem and you're just busting it apart. So I don't know how well any of us would do uh, in our lives if we had somebody come around every year with a ball and uh, a wrecking ball and, and knock our houses down. So that's the first thing. The, the second principle is to keep the ground covered, keep the soil covered, because that protects these organisms from the extremes of heat and rain and cold. It, it buffers it and it also keeps the soil from eroding, which is really important because if you lose your topsoil, you lose the organisms with it and you lose your ability to grow things. So keep, so you don't disturb the soil, keep it covered and keep live roots in the ground. Uh, and you want to keep live roots in the ground because it's those roots that are feeding your workforce, your underground workforce. They're, they need food. They get some of it from the residue that's left on the soil. But a lot of it, science is telling us now, comes through the roots. The, the roots of the plants actually feed the organisms and they do it on purpose because the organisms feed them in return. So it's, it's a nice, the original carbon exchange system is happening beneath our feet in the soil and you have to keep live roots in, in the ground in order for that to happen. And th another principle is to optimize diversity because uh, diversity is important to both above and the below ground because those organisms that are down there they can only do their jobs, most of them do their job in a, under a certain set of circumstances, a certain temperature range or a certain amount of humidity, of uh, moisture content. And if that changes, which it does during the year, it was ongoing, then a lot of them become dormant. But if you have diversity in your soil, you've got another set just waiting there, ready to come on. They've, been do they've gone dormant in the, in the past, but now they'll come forward and they'll do all that soil building for you. So. You, uh, you need to have diversity in your soil. You need to uh, not disturb the soil. You need to keep it covered <clears throat> and you need roots in the soil. And you also need to be, this is the fifth principle. And this is the one that we elevated to the to principle in our report. You don't, often, don't find it in all others. And that is to optimize your inputs. That means that when, when you're putting something into the soil, whether it's a, a nutrient or whether it's a crop protection product, you need to be mindful of the kinds of effects that it will have. It's one of the, and of course, being with the compost council, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that compost is one of the best things you can add because it 
feeds those organisms and it also adds to their diversity. So these are the kinds of things that you need to think about. You need to keep those five principles in mind. And if you keep those five principles in mind, you, you will build soil carbon. And, and you, the, the networks and the credibility of the Soil Conservation Council of Canada, a longstanding organization that has been a leader in soil conservation and, and, and compelling folks to move forward, th that in combination with the Compost Council, you, your networks, did you find people across the country, did you find farmers, landscapers, gardeners that are showing that these principles actually work? Yeah, we did. We have some case studies of farmers. Now, we didn't include case studies for uh, landscapers or gardeners. It, it was a little more difficult to find those, but we do know they're happening. It's just that they're not as easy to, to uh, find. But uh, I know from personal experience, because I've met people that are doing this. But let's focus right now for a minute on the farmers. We, we have five farmers in our report that are uh, uh, really good examples uh, of what you know, uh, let, let's say of uh, soil carbon builders. That's what they're soil managers that are building soil carbon. And I'd just like to mention a couple of them quickly, just to give you an example. One, one is a farm in Saskatchewan, Southern Saskatchewan. Uh, Derek and Tannis Axton, a couple with a family that run this farm, and they've been doing this kind of thing for about 10 years. And in that 10 years, they've increased their soil organic carbon by 1%. Now that doesn't, might not seem like a lot, but it is because when you if you if you were at say two and a half or three percent when you started and you're now up to three and a half or four percent you have been have sequestered an enormous amount of carbon because there's a lot of carbon in a, in a hectare of soil so that's one thing but at, while they've been doing that on six thousand uh acres i might add and they have also uh reduced their inputs uh by about 80 percent which is saving them a lot of money and they've haven't lost yield, they've increased their yield. And they're no longer using insecticide. Now, here is another thing about the actions I think is really important to mention. It's their infiltration rate of rainfall on their land. This is something that soil health experts use. It's a measure that people use to see how good your soil structure is. Can your soil take the rainfall in, allow it to go down to diffuse into the soil and then be held there so that you've got good moisture capacity you're holding moisture for your crops or does the rain hit and then seal off the top and then run off taking your nutrients and everything with it this is a big deal in farming so when the accidents started they were only able to infiltrate a half an inch of rain per hour if it if it was higher rainfall than that it was running off after the 10 years now they can now infiltrate six inches an hour and they can take in an inch in 30 seconds so that's the difference in the soil structure that the organisms and the high carbon levels are doing in their in their soil. And uh, uh, they, they, the best management practices they use are things like no-till. They don't till anymore. They cover. They use cover crops. That's roots in the soil again. There's the principle. Keep those roots in the soil. Uh, they do intercropping where they do more than one crop at a time. And they use compost and compost extract. So they, and there's a whole, in the report, there's a whole variety of things that they use to get the great results. A second one, and I'll just mention this quickly is, uh, but it's, it's also really important is uh, uh, Jocelyn Michon's farm in uh, St. Hyacinth, Quebec. And they do, uh, or Jocelyn uses things like crop rotations with legumes. He's a no-till farmer, he uses cover crops, and he does something called control traffic, which is really important because it keeps the wheels going on the same spots all the time. So you, where, so you don't compact your soil and, and where you're growing things. His yields are 11% higher than his neighbors, 40% higher than the provincial average. And yet he's saving $100,000 a year from reduced inputs. Uh, he cut his nitrogen and phosphorus use in half. So, and while he's been doing this, he's been taking more than two tons of carbon out of the atmosphere for every hectare of land that he manages every year. So, there's the, the, our leader, the leadership said the innovators are there, the early adopters are there, they're doing it. It's a question of getting that, of spreading that to everyone. And I, I, Jim? So I, if I, if I can, I'd like to just get a quick comment in on, on your question about the network that we found in, in this project. I think people in our business um, are seeing that the whole interest in soil health 
and in the value of soil in Canada is, is kind of exploding right now. It's growing so so greatly that our network is is so much broader than it was 10 years ago. And that's that's really really makes projects like this timely. But we're finding more and more reasons for people to be involved in soil health, finding the benefits. And we're seeing that that um, the people that are, are approaching us from different parts of a society, not just agriculture is growing, the interest from industry is growing and certainly the interest in, from governments and the commitments from government uh, are growing too. So it's it's uh, it's not just the network we talk to. There's a there's a big ecosystem out there of people interested in soils. Well, and that's, you know, bravo to you both and your organizations, of course, and of course, uh, the funder Metcalf Foundation for giving the means to move this forward and certainly your diligence for the last two plus years to to work the numbers and work the networks to to put together such a credible report is is phenomenal. And what is so sometimes these things work out because um, the government of Canada has just announced some serious funding to go ahead and start looking at um, healthy soils. And, and your report basically gives a roadmap for the next for that to not just to be a discussion point, but rather to move into action. Could you talk a little bit about your, your call to action and the recommendations that are coming out from this report? Sure. So I, I think the, the, the recommendations are a call for action. And a, the, the background of our previous conversation about the growing interest of, uh, of, in Canada on soil health, the identification of more and more benefits to us, the leadership of government, we're all coming together in a timely way. So our recommendations, and there are 11 of them, I don't want to read them there. Um, people can, can go to our websites and download the report and read them on their own. But we uh, we intended those to be complementary to all of those things, particularly to the leadership we see from the federal government right now in, in their funding programs. Uh, but there's always gaps that, uh, that need to be filled and strengthened. And we thought that uh, there were a couple uh, that you'll see as you read our recommendations, um, like leadership. Um, things don't happen on their own. Um, and uh, there, there needs to be uh, ongoing leadership to achieve the results that we think we can achieve, um, both in government and outside the government in, in, in the delivery of programs. We need to get momentum going. Uh, and I think, again, kudos to, to Agriculture and Agriculture Canada. Things like the Living Labs program are, are a good way to get that momentum going and to get people seeing these things, doing them on their farms and, and, and achieving success. That's, that's really the important part. Um, we need to see more engagement of people in, in, in that. We need to expand our knowledge base and maintain it. And we need to understand the value of soil health and the benefits like its impact on climate change. Those things need to be studied uh, and on an ongoing, in an ongoing way. And we also need to see, uh, to, to put it bluntly, we need to see soils at the policy table. We need to, it needs to be one of the lenses that people use to develop policy. And I don't think it's there right now. I think we can do better. So. All of our recommendations uh, sort of gather around the, the task of maximizing the, the benefits that soils can bring in climate change and all of the other areas that we, uh, we talked about. It's not gonna do itself, it's gonna take a lot of coordination and it's not something you do once. Um, you don't get healthy once in your life, you gotta fight to stay healthy your whole life. So this is a long struggle we see, we see commitment from governments, we see commitments from people, and a lot of our recommendations are about how we try to bring those assets together for the future. I think what you said in your, uh, in your uh, comments at the, the launch that we just had was that it really is a no regrets strategy and, and that it's not uh, something that, uh, is, is, is the confidence you've built through the report and the multi-layer benefits that we can attain through focusing on soil. Basically, it's, it, it, it's a let's get it done. 
And uh, so uh, congratulations on, on moving this forward um, and particularly celebrating this during Soil Conservation Week. Uh, that's uh, that's something that ra raising the awareness, like you said, Jim, in terms of the value of our soils. You know, we talk about air, we talk about water. Um, it's time that uh, soil also gets into the the forefront of these conversations. And I think the the um, credibility and the incredible commitment that both of you and the organizations that uh, support you have done is a reflection on uh, getting us to this start. Um, Glenn, did you have anything else that you'd like to talk about in terms of moving things forward? Uh, well, I think we've covered the main points, but I, I do think that it, there's a couple of things that worth mentioning. Uh, one is that we, the, going back to the economics again, uh, you know, uh, Jim uh, is want to say from his experience with working with farmers that if it pays, it stays. Uh, in other words, in a, a new practice adopted, if it, if it makes sense financially, then it will, it will be a permanent practice on the farm. And I, I think that letting or, or having the information out there that allows farmers to make that kind of calculation when they're sitting at their table and working on what they're going to do next year, to be able to make those calculations and see how it's going to pay and have the knowledge you know the data available and and examples nearby i think that's really important and I, the, the living labs are important in that regard but so are the innovators and i mentioned two of them there are quite a few of them across the country and uh some kind of a of a mentorship connection between the innovators and the people who want to move in that direction would be really important so i i think i would really uh, hang my hat a lot on the fact that uh it, it that the nothing succeeds like success if you have success examples that are working and other people can see them and can say hey i could do that uh, that's exactly how derek Axon got started he, he read a farmer in the united states was doing this went to his farm visited it, said hey i can do that this is fantastic and he's been doing it ever since so that's i really i'm really pumped up about that i think that's what we need to do is get them get that information out and uh, 2030, although it seems like eight years from now, it seemed perhaps a, a long time. We don't have a long time to, to move forward in terms of uh, reducing, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So in terms of the, with the eight years, can we get this done, Jim? Yeah, we're doing, I think Glenn's made the point beautifully that we're doing it now. Uh, and, and I think that we've got the will in Canada to do it. We've got the resources, the knowledge, uh, and and the capacity to do it. So I I think that I think that we can make uh, great progress, but it's urgent. It's uh, eight years is not very long uh, for this, but we're doing it now. We're in the business. We have all the tools, and resources we need. It's now just keeping that coalition of people together to to get this done. And the, the report is available where? It's available on our website, soilcc.ca. And it's available on the Compost Council website too, www.compost.org. Super. And uh, so it, you know, the call to action is there. Um, the, the results in terms of your report certainly are, are solid. It's based on science. It's based on a commitment from uh, folks from across the country, from different perspectives, researchers, government, farmers in action. Now the opportunity is to move things forward. We're all compelled to, to want to do something. And for, for you to have given us this opportunity to show that soil can be recruited as, an, as a powerful ally, that, that we can have victory in this, in this, uh, in this uh, arena, and also get the uh, positive benefits that are uh, phenomenal in terms of productivity and, and water quality and, and a good communities is, is, a, is a testament to, to you both. And I want to thank you very much. I know that you've got lots more things to do. And so um, hats off to you both and to your organizations and uh, together victory will happen. So thank you very much. All the very best. Thanks. And thank you to the Metcalf Foundation. Absolutely. Bye for now.